Team Fortress 2, lacking a competitive game mode since day one of release on October 10th, 2007. From more recent events, January 26th, 2016, the Team Fortress 2 competitive beta group was founded. After the announcement, the community rejoiced and waited for the beta to come out. And when it did, it came with a side of salt. Not at the competitive beta itself, aside from all the abandons. With people expecting whitelists and weapon bans, everyone was kinda disappointed. People thought, will Valve ever ban weapons such as Criticola, Pompson, Natasha, and Quickfix, etc? And they haven't yet, so this leads to the thought that Valve will not be banning any weapons. Recently, Valve has not released too many weapons. Due to possible backlash from the community about X weapon being too strong before the release of competitive, if we look over at Counter-Strike Global Offensive, we had the release of the R8 Revolver, and that was horrible. <laughs> Players with hundreds of hours in the game quit due to Valve just not caring anymore. Valve could easily repeat their mistakes in Team Fortress 2, or leave things as it is and not ban anything. But before we grab our pitchforks and torches, let's look at today's 6v6 whitelist from UGC. For each class, I created a banned loadout. Wait, let's call that Forbidden Loadout, yeah, that sounds cool. These loadouts consist of almost all banned weapons from UGC6's whitelist. So let's start at the top of the list. Our loadout for Scout will be Soda Popper, Coca-Cola, and Sandman. A rundown of her weapons are, the Soda Popper gives the user 50% faster firing speed, along with 25% faster reload time. When her height meter is completely full, you can activate it with alternate fire and gain multiple jumps. The only downside of this weapon is a minus 66% clip size, which is really 4 shots less than the default scattergun. Secondly, the Criticola. You gain 25% movement speed and mini crits, guaranteed, after drinking for a second or two. The only downside is the damage taken is increased by 10%, which is the only drawback aside from the cooldown. Lastly, the Sandman. The Sandman will reduce your health by 15, which is a lot for Scout. Having only 125 health brings you down to a measly 110. Hitting the second fire button, you will launch a baseball towards your cursor which can stun enemies for a certain amount of time, depending on the distance. Too close and the enemy will not be stunned at all. These weapons are insanely powerful, and since they can easily win a duel in any situation due to the attack and reload speed buffs on Soda Popper, even without Soda Popper, using a Criticola can give you similar results, or even better. Since the stock scattergun has 6 shots instead of 2, if you can get 6 consecutive shots into an enemy with mini crits, that's insane. As long as you land your shots, you'll be unstoppable. The thing is about these weapons is that when people use them, you're forced to play around them. You'll have to know when the enemy scout doesn't have Criticola or their Sandman ball to push up a lot safer. For Soldier's Forbidden Loadout, we have the Beggar's Bazooka, Battle Lion's Backup, and Disciplinary Action. Actually, I'm really bad at the Beggar's Bazooka. <laughs> Let's go with Cow Mangler instead. The Cow Mangler provides an unlimited recharge system instead of ammo, giving the user more time to fight instead of searching for ammo crates. The second fire button will charge all four shots and fire off a larger blast which will set players on fire while mini critting them and even disable buildings for four seconds. On the other side, the Mangler deals only 20% of its damage to buildings, which is a major drawback if you are alone. But if you have your team, you can easily destroy the building with your alternate fire. The Battle Lion's backup gives a 20 max health buff on the user. After your Rage Bar is full, you can use it and gain a 50% reduced sentry damage buff and a 35% damage reduction buff from all other sources. And this buff isn't just for you, this is for your whole entire team around you. The only downside to using this weapon is not having a shotgun or boots for jumping. The disciplinary action is a whip that gives ally players as well as the user themselves a speed boost for a limited amount of time. The only drawback is a minus 25% damage penalty. Now the Cow Mangler and Battle Lion's backup sound pretty insane on paper. And in game it's no different. The secondary fire on the Cow Mangler is way too strong, as it has insane damage alongside the area of effect sapper. The Batline's backup buff is pretty crazy considering your whole team can take a load of reduced damage. The Batline's backup gives you an enormous advantage, almost like you're playing Medic. Soldiers should not be giving these game-changing effects. Medic should. That's probably why it's banned in UGC. The disciplinary action is something I feel on the fence about being banned in UGC 6s. The disciplinary can get a team to an objective sooner, which is the goal of the game. It seems like an instant pickup, but it's more than that. It's dependent on your playstyle. 
If you are more of a around the team person, run whip. If you are more of a solo man, run escape plan. Loadout variations should not be impossible to make, and I feel you should be able to adapt your weapons to your playstyle, and not be forced to take things like disciplinary action. For Pyro, we have Phlogistonator, Reserve Shooter, and Power Jack. And before you tell me, Flag does not have an air blast, why do you use Reserve? That's why I'm doing two loadouts. Starting with the Flog, you have no air blast, but you can have a oomph charge. I'm not... I'm not... I'm not gonna say that, I'm just gonna call it charge. When this charge is completely filled, it can be used with secondary fire to become invulnerable during activation. Then, gain guaranteed critical damage. The reserve shooter deploys 20% faster and will mini crit any enemy that is airborne. The only debuff is a minus 34 clip size, which is two shotgun shells. And lastly, the power jack. It's well known for its 15% movement speed buff and a 20% increased damage taken debuff. Many pyros like to run pyrojack to get to their destination quicker, and it is an amazing item. But in UGC6s, it is banned. Does UGC just not like movement speed buffs? Flog and Reserve are considered two noob or easy weapons. Flog for its W plus M1 inspiration, and Reserve for doing its mini crit damage for almost free. Demo Man, we're running Lock and Load, Tide Turner, and the Caber. The Lock and Load with a 20% bonus damage verse buildings and 25% projectile speed buff. Now the debuffs are quite immense. There's one less pipe in your clip, there's a smaller explosion radius, and there's a lack of roller pipes, meaning you cannot have pipes roll on the ground. The Tide Turner gifts the user with 15% fire and explosive damage resistance, alongside a full turning control while charging and 75% charge refill on melee kill. The only downside is not having stickies and taking damage while charging reduces the total charge time and distance. The Tide Turner will not guarantee a full crit at the end of the charge, but instead a mini crit. Now the Kaber. With a slower swing rate of 20% and double the deploy time, you would think, why would I need this? The passive effect of the Kaber is on first hit, it will cause an explosion around you, dealing damage to yourself and others. With these three weapons, it's really fun. The lock and load gives you a huge advantage over destroying sentries from afar with your projectile speed buff. The tide turner gives you so much mobility from trimping across ramps that you don't need to use stickies to travel. With full turn control, trimping is made so easy. And so is surprising your enemies. For heavy weapons guy, we have Natasha, Telokospar, and Fists of Steel. The Natasha, a minigun that slows, what a great idea, huh? Despite the minus 25% damage penalty and 30% slower spin up time, you have a 100% chance to slow enemies, and a minus 20% damage resistance buff. The Delocos Bar, you gain 50 maximum health for 30 seconds, and can gain up to 100 health healing. This can also be thrown as a small med kit for your allies. The cooldown of the Delocos Bar is 10 seconds. So you can basically have 350 health the whole game if you wanted to, as long as you keep eating every 30 or so seconds or whenever you wanted, as the cooldown of the Locos Bar needs to be increased by a lot. Fist of Steel, while active, grants a minus 40% damage taken from ranged attacks buff, but also gains 100% damage from melee attacks and holsters 100% slower. But Natasha's slow is way too strong since it has a 100% chance to slow and your odds of getting out of the way of a Natasha heavy are slim. The Delocos Bar is a quick fix medic in your pocket. You get a free 100 HP whenever you need it and a bonus max health buff. You can take Fist of Steel out in the middle of a fight, go to your local food market, buy whatever you need for the next 6 months and come back to Team Fortress 2 and still have 200 health. The Fist of Steel damage reduction is a bit insane for just holding gloves out. The melee debuff is a good balance idea, but you know, everyone wants to go near the heavy, right? A scout has the best chance of getting the melee kill due to their speed and ability to get to the front of the line. For Engineer, we have Pompson, Short Circuit, and Gunslinger. The Pompson used to be one of my favorite weapons because it is straight overpowered. Pyros cannot deflect the Pompson. And if it hits a spy, oh, they're done. 20% of their cloak is gone just from hitting them with the Pompson. Oh, and you think that was rough? Try 10% loss of the many gun charge on medic hit. The short circuit, no ammo again, but instead, firing costs 5 metal and doesn't require a reload. The alternate fire is best used for defending your sentry. 
as it will stop demo and soldiers from spamming you out. The gunslinger. Everyone knows this devil machine. This stupid metal hand can give the user 25 maximum health for some odd reason. And instead of sentries, they build mini sentries, which are built faster than usual and fire faster as well. Also, an amazing weapon to deal with heavies or enemies with a lot of HP, because every third successful punch will always crit. Woohoo! Yeah! These three items are hell playing against. The Pompson does absurd damage and has a really large hitbox for some reason. You'd think the ability to build only mini sentries is a debuff, but it is not by any means. For the medic, we have the quick fix and the Vita Saw. There's no primary bands for the medic. Woohoo! The quick fix is exactly what the name says. It gives the target you're healing a 40% increased heal rate and even grants the medic with 25% faster uber charge rate. The only downside is overheals are cut in half and you do not have an actual uber. You will gain a massive overheal and healing buff. You can also move faster than whatever target you're healing, great with scouts, and blast jump with your target, making it great with soldiers and demos. What a coincidence that all three of these classes are played in sixes, huh? The Vitasaw is an underused weapon with a nice passive effect. You can store up to 20% uber after death. You cannot respawn with more than 20%. But for some reason when you spawn you get 19% and then it instantly jumps to 20 as soon as you heal someone. The debuff side is minus 10 maximum health for the user. Quick fix and Vitasaw combo is really nice as you can get quick fix, you know, quickly and can spawn with up to 20% which makes it stupid good. Despite the overheal debuff from quick fix and the health debuff from Vitasaw, these two items together make an over aggressive type of playstyle which can drag out the game for a long period of time or make the game snowball quickly till the end of the round. For Sniper we have Hitman's Heatmaker and Darwin's Danger Shield. We're also going to be looking at Cleaner's Carbine since I'm only using two weapons. The Hitman's Heatmaker has a special type of charge called Focus. When Focus is completely full or you're focused, you can hit the reload key to activate it and while in focus you cannot unscope but have a 25% faster charge rate. The debuff of the weapon is body shots will deal 20% less damage. The Darwin's Danger Shield replaces your SMG with a plus 25 max health buff and 15% bullet damage resistance. The drawback is an extra 20% damage taken from explosives. The Cleaner's Carbine is an SMG that will fill a charge meter as you damage enemies with it. After your charge is full, second fire will activate mini crits for 8 seconds. These mini crits will transfer over to any weapon you have. With the debuff of 25% slower firing speed and 20% clip size reduction, it's quite the trade off for mini crits only. The Hitman Team Maker can be incredibly strong in the hands of someone who can aim. The ability to not unscope will give the user higher chances of landing headshots as they don't have to rescope and waste time. Each headshot will extend the focus, giving you even more chances to headshot people. I feel Danger Shield ruins sniper vs sniper duels, but everything else it's fine. The Cleaner's Carbine is interesting. Since you can activate mini crits then change to your melee on sniper, you have way increased damage. If you're using bushwaka, you have guaranteed crits the whole time. Last but not least, the spy. For spy we have the enforcer, spicicle, and red tape recorder. I'm also tossing in the diamond back because gotta have a little extra for the last class, you know? The enforcer will give you a 20% bonus damage increase while disguised, giving you about 10 or 15 damage depending on how close to the enemy you are. The only debuff it has is 20% slower firing speed, and that's a lot. The Diamondback grants a guaranteed critical hit for any building destroyed with a sapper or a backstab kill. The Spicicle will give you a fireproof buff for 1 second and afterburn immunity for 10 seconds, which regenerates after 15 seconds or by picking up ammo. The other drawback is your backstabs make an ice statue of your victim, telling the enemy team, Hey, I was over here just a few seconds ago! And finally, the Red Tape Recorder. The Red Tape Recorder has a minus 100% sapper damage penalty, dealing less damage to the building, but instead reversing the building's construction. You can easily downgrade a level 3 sentry into a level 1, giving your team a huge advantage wasting the engineer's time trying to rebuild it. The Enforcer doesn't seem that strong. It was nerfed a while back, and now it only has a damage buff while disguised. The Enforcer only gives you a solid 10 or so damage buff, and it's not that big of a deal considering if you have a stock revolver and shoot quicker, you have a bigger damage output. 
The Diamondback's passive is a bit strong since destroying buildings isn't too hard. Getting a chain stab will grant you loads of crits. The Spicicle is quite the trade off for the default knife. Risking your ability to backstab for 15 seconds which is a key point of spy, but also gaining the ability to survive pyro checks is a strong thing to have. The Spicicle is great with Dead Ringer as you get Dead Ringer, then take your knife out to extinguish the flames to make a more realistic death. And the Red Tape Recorder. As I said before, it's better for wasting the engineer's time and giving your team the advantage. Despite the damage debuff, it's amazing for weakening your enemy's hold. Now after going through all these classes and losing about 4 hours of footage in the process, I kept trying to think, why should Valve ban this weapon, or this weapon? But then it hit me. Why not have a banning system in competitive? Players can vote on 3 weapons to ban that one game so no one can use it. Example, 2 players are voting on banning Criticola, 1 votes on Danger Shield, 1 votes on Spicicle, and the last 2 vote on Natasha. Now you can't ban stock weapons because that <laughs> that would just be stupid. And now there's four weapons up for ban. The Natasha and Criticola are banned because they had majority vote. And then the team re-votes on Spicicle vs Danger Shield. If the votes are even, it's picked randomly. And wait, before you say, what if the other team bans the same things? One team picks their bans, and then the other team picks theirs. Whichever team starts first is random. It really shouldn't matter. This way, both teams can ban weapons they both don't want. This is the optimal choice, since Valve can implement a weapon restriction system without receiving a load of backlash from the community. If the enemy team bans something you wanted to use, you can't be mad at Valve, you can be mad at the other team. And that's really it. That's all I have to say for now. I kinda really just did a bunch of weapon reviews, but that's just my philosophy, so it's whatever. I'm just putting it out there so you can see it. If you watched the whole video, I've really got to thank you, because this one took a while. So thanks for watching, leave suggestions, bye.